Welcome to the Bedrock Way Podcast, where we're changing the habits of yesterday by creating the new healthcare reality of tomorrow. And today, Jonathan, we have a very, very special guest. I'm so excited, I can't even get my work straight. And the reason I'm so excited is that as someone who oversees a multi-specialty medical practice, we employ over 80 clinicians uh, nationwide. And one thing that has always, always, always uh, not made sense to me is the aspect of the physician needing that patient-centric healing touch and needing that ability to connect with their patients. And then a lot of our doctors are losing their personalities, right? They're, use, they're losing that emotional connection with their patients that really transcends and transforms the patient journey. And as Dr. Dana Curiel will speak, as a medical doctor and someone who relies highly on the inherent intuitive talents, not the ones she acquired, right, but the ones that she was God-given, you know, someone who relies on that, you know, in her patient um, to provide her experience, we're, we're seeing more and more people lose that, more and more physicians lose that, and, and nowhere was that more prevalent than in the 90s when we the Balanced Budget Act brought in something called the electronic medical record and the electronic health record, right, and losing that relationship with, with, with the, uh, the patient. So, one thing that I loved about Dr. Dana Curiel, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll read her bio in a second, is the fact that she's branching out of medicine, right? She's very much a physician, but she also wants to branch out and in, engage what she calls digital entrepreneurship and what I describe as a physician who is tackling on the offensive what we call digital bureaucracy. That is really engulfing and affecting a lot of our medical doctors and overall healthcare system. And, uh, and she's leveraging that to help clinicians and develop what she calls a special sauce, right? And that's to add to every physician their identity, right? And we live in a world where social media is king. And that old adage, Dr. Curiel, where the tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to listen to it, did it make a sound? If you're the best medical doctor that graduated number one at a Harvard Medical School, but nobody knows about you, how good of a doctor are you, right? So it's all about your digital footprint, just as much as your clinical training. So it is my pleasure to have Dana Curiel, Dr. Curiel, on our Bedrock Way podcast to hear her mission, her vision, and what she sees beyond the exam room. Welcome to the Bedrock Way podcast, Dr. Curiel. Thank you. That was a really great introduction. And you pretty much summed up so much of how I feel. So I think we can wrap it up. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, listen, we're going to have a ton of fun. We're going to have a ton of fun. Uh, but let's let's start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, how you got into it. And again, you're you're probably the one to two percent of doctors who are thinking about this space, let alone doing something about it. But no, everyone is very, again, um, overwhelmed with not only healthcare, right? We're on the heels of the hangover of the pandemic. A lot of people are dealing with financial constraints and being able to run their operations, being able to pay off uh, school loans and just keeping the doors open, let alone looking to help themselves in a different realm and helping other physicians. So tell me how you got into it and what was the, the impetus, the crossroad that allowed you to say, you know what, I got to look outside the, 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 the exam room and start helping our other exam room and potentially boardroom physicians? So, <clears throat> I mean, I've got a very sort of traditional past. I studied in medical school. I did my residency in a medical program. I then became an internist and I practiced internal medicine on an outpatient basis in different, different ways that really don't aren't relevant to this particular conversation. Um, but it was actually my stepping away from medicine when I had my third child um, and gave myself, finally gave myself that time to be mom um, that really introduced me to the concept of, wow, there is life beyond medicine. And what happened to me is very, um, very common to those who practice medicine in that we really just dedicate our life to medicine and we do it all the way through and we don't take breaks and we don't 
kind of look inside and we don't look around. We just don't have the time. We don't have the energy. We don't have the headspace. Um, so my story was that I did that. Um, I actually took time away. I thought I was taking time away to bond with my children because I was having my third son and I had my other two sons then. But in reality, I actually ended up bonding with myself. It sounds a little cliche, but it's true. Um, and discovering all these things that I nurtured since then that have really served me well in uh, what I do today and, and having become an entrepreneur. Oh my, I love that. Oh, you were able to bond with yourself. My goodness. How many more people would be better off if they do a little bit more of that bonding with themselves? Where where would our, our mental wellness, and I call our mental fitness be right now, if people did a little bit more of that soul searching, right? And reflected on the things that you do well, but maybe on the things that you need to improve upon. My goodness, what, what a, what a uh, concept. So Dr. Curiel is a traditionally trained internist who unleashed her creativity mid-career as you listen to take on digital entrepreneurship. Love that. She's now the founder, editor, and CEO of Some Docs. Now, why is it that you have it S-O and then the M and then E? It's... So it's because it's pronounced so me docs and I, wa I wanted you to say that. For, right. And it stands for social media doctor. So so me is just a nickname for social media. Um, and when I first was starting out, uh, it first started out as a community of physicians that were interested in finding out, hey, what is this whole new world about? Um, you know, I decided to call it so me docs. It was a really quick very easy name to say. Um, some people still call it some docs because they don't realize it's <laughs> it's pronounced some docs, but that's perfectly fine. Um, and we have so much going on in so me docs. Our hub is at doctorsonsocialmedia.com. Um, and there, there's a lot, a lot, it's, it's a healthcare innovation hub. So there's a lot of resources. Um, there's three public arms on our site. So that may interest your audience just because I'm sure a lot of people listening are interested in healthcare and all the sort of innovation that's happening in healthcare today. I will tell you, this conversation will go viral. And the reason that it will go viral is that people will log on to meet a doctor, because again, we live in a day and age where that relationship with our doctors is is strained, right? So one thing that we're trying to do is what we call repair the severed vocal cords that the pandemic unfortunately caused. And so people will log on, listen to you, but when they see, first of all, you look amazing, you sound even better, and the, and your mission to me is 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 incredible. So this is going to be a triple threat for us. So as Dr. Curl wow. mentioned, doctors on social media aims to promote the autonomy of physicians by building a unique online healthcare hub. Dr. Curiel leads, teaches, and helps promote an exclusive doctor community, the Somi Docs Network, looking to grow beyond the exam room and has also opened a new private doctor community called Doctor Side Ventures. What is that? So that's a community that specifically focuses on the things that we do on the side, a lot of my colleagues really um, want to focus either on medicine or on the things that we do outside of medicine. And so it felt important to open a community that really focused on both of those things. Um, so we have specifically a Facebook group where doctors get vetted in and we speak about, you know, the different amazing and super interesting things that doctors are doing on the side. And we are able to speak more or less freely in there because it really is a community that is made of just doctors. So we can vent to one another and we can be real with one another and we can tell each other exactly what we are doing on the side and what some of our struggles are. And likewise, I, um, also incorporated a side ventures section to doctors on social media.com that would sort of work and be nurtured in parallel to this online community. So that's the purpose of it. A lot of physicians nowadays are struggling, they're burning out, um, they're not happy. And so side venturing, so to speak, 
helps them to at least find something else that they can integrate into their lifestyle, incorporate into their daily routines, and just be able to work as physicians um, in a better place. I will tell you, in a day and age where the mass exodus of physicians that are leaving healthcare is at an all-time high, I believe last year over 70,000 left, this year over 60,000 will leave uh, healthcare medicine altogether. And I mean, we're, we're seeing a, a population that continues to be more and more highly acute. In 10 years, the average wait for a physician visit will be over a year. And it's estimated that we'll have a shortage of 86,000 primary care physicians. So I will, I will tell you, as someone who is knee deep in this space, I appreciate what you're doing. And I'll tell you what the doctor side ventures is doing. Not only is it secure and procuring the future of medicine, but while physicians are saving lives, you're saving the life of physicians, which I think, and I know that that'll be a way for us to hopefully leave healthcare better than we entered it. I give you lots of credit for that. Uh, Dr. Curry also advises digital startups and individual brands, both of whom desire to uniquely stand out in the digital space. She has taught at conferences that include Harvard, Harvard's Med Writing, Publishing, and Social Media for Healthcare Professionals, Women in Medicine, Women Physician Wellness, Innovator MD, Leverage and Growth Summit, um, among others. Wow. Dr. Curio has earned recognitions including top 10 internists to follow on Twitter, now X, by Medical Economics, and top 20 social media physician influencers by Medscape. She has appeared in major outlets such as LA Times, Gastro and Endo News, MD Magazine, The Boston Globe, Huffington Post, Medscape, EP News, and can be heard on various podcasts, including her own two seasons with Dr. Samuel Shem, author of The House of God. What is that? Tell me about that. Yeah. So um, Samuel Shem, that's actually his pen name. Um, his real name is Dr. Stephen Bergman. He is a legend. Um, he wrote a very well-known novel called The House of God. He's since followed it up with other uh, follow-up novels, but he's extremely well-known. I mean, most medical students at the medical student phase um, have read this book. Um, it's not an easy book to get through just because it really, um, it's tongue in cheek and it really hones in on um, the evils and the bad things about medicine. So um, not everybody loves it, but everybody knows about it. Um, so he is really a legend. And I, you know, got connected with him um, years back and we really, uh, had a spark between us. Like we really connected so, so much and we became really close friends. I actually, he just celebrated his 80th um, and I couldn't make it, but I sent in a little video. Um, but he uh, then hosted two seasons of a series that him and I termed conversations with Shem that really revolved around healthcare and why it's broken. Very similar to what you and I are doing wow. here. Yeah, but we did it with, you know, the first season was with um, doctors that I brought to the table. So it was three doctors per episode. So it was like a round table. Sure. Um, and then the next season was he brought his friends um, into the record, the virtual recording studio. And we're actually him and I are now recording a third season about Shem. So that's wow. the nutshell. I love it. I love it. Dr. Curiel's most recently published a book. A Women Physician Essays, published April 2023 by Kent State Press. Her special soft skills, I love this, included digital design and out-of-the-boxes ideas, which enhance company growth and user experience, social content created rapidly for competitive growth, and community building strategies. Now, you guys are focusing strictly on medical practices? No, we are focused specifically on the individuals that run healthcare. So the individual physicians at this moment in time, we do welcome podiatrists and dentists. Um, we will, we are hoping to open up other directories on the site to others, whether it be other healthcare specialties, healthcare professionals, for example, occupational therapists, physical therapists, et cetera, um, and also potentially 
and we also actually have medical students and pre-med students, but hopefully we will also be opening up to experts that help doctors. So folks that are creating resources, creating podcasts, creating services that can help doctors to individually shine um, or take their practices to the next level. So ours is really a really great hub where it starts with a directory that's beautiful, that's organized, where anybody can, for example, land on it. For example, you, right? You're like, you know what? I do want to mm, build my next episode based around doctors. You can click into our doctor directory and you can not only pick the doctors and send in an inquiry to them without paying anybody any money, but you could use our filters and say, you know what, I want to pick cardiologists for my next episode because I'm going to be talking about cardiomyopathy, right? A heart illness. And you can then even niche it down to, I want to pick doctors that have their own direct care clinic, or I want to pick doctors that use social media so they can help me to promote the episode. So I'm going to then check off YouTube, right? So I need a cardiologist and I need them to be on YouTube. You could filter out exactly who's there and they pop up and then open up each one, take a look at them before you reach out and say, does this fit? Does this not fit? I want to make sure I bring in a few women, a few men and make it a really great diverse panel. Um, and hopefully that that's what the directory helps folks like you to do. Now, let me ask you something. That directory, is it a generalized repository of physicians or are they vetted to be, and get again, as engaging and as um, dynamic as yourself? That's a great question. No, we do not. Um, the premise of what I've built is that every physician has earned a medical degree because they are bright enough to have done so, right? You can't earn a medical degree if you don't pass your tests. So by nature of having that MD or that DO attached to your name, um, you have proven that you can pass. So with that premise, anybody really can grow from a seedling, right, to a beautiful plant, whether or not you consider me a beautiful plant in the definition of that I'm, you know, charismatic or I speak or I can have, you know, a converse, I can hold a conversation is obviously subjective, but not everyone is, but everybody can. So the premise is that here are the doctors. You could click in and you can actually also see what kind of work they've done. Some of them have given lectures. You can click into the lecture and you could see a little snippet of it and see for yourself what the doc's like. Maybe you want a more quiet doctor. Maybe you want one that's really outgoing and exciting. So those are kind of built into the directory. But no, you're not necessarily getting someone who is super outgoing and all that stuff. Uh, you know, it would be, that would be a different model. I think it would be a different business model than the one we have where we are really trying to promote the individuals within healthcare, knowing that everyone's got their own personality. Some folks can shine on a podcast. Other folks can shine in an article that they can write. So they would fit in a magazine, but they are all um, listed in our directory. Now we do have a speaker directory. So those are the doctors that would say, you know what? I also want to put myself out there as a speaker. Understood. So you could, exactly. You could click into the speaker directory. Those are the people that hopefully are more willing to be outgoing and charismatic and go on podcasts and into events because they've decided to become speakers. Good. Cause I was going to say, listen, it's, it's nice and dandy to say that, but let's be honest. <laughs> There's I, 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 I pick very specifically the people who are on this podcast that have MDDO and I, and it's not their nomenclature that qualifies them is who they are as human beings. So because the degree right. to me doesn't matter. What matters to right. me is can they hold the conversation where to me is, is is a critical thinking and it's and it's a conversation where it creates interest. Right. Because a lot of smart people out there that can interest, you know, a, a you rather watch paint dry at that point in time. Totally. 
100%. So, so Dr. Colonel adds particular value to startups in the health and healthcare space, having practiced medicine as a board certified internist and pioneer in the healthcare digital revolution. So me docs continues to be a rapidly growing online healthcare media platform at doctors on social media.com and Dr. Curiel can be reached there at so me docs at so me docs.com. That cannot be that difficult to remember. She can also be reached through her portfolio website and blog D R C O R R I E L Dr. We will put the link on the podcast episode when it airs. So people have the access to get to you. So let's get right into it. I want to know from someone who, again, is a change agent, you're a disruptor. That's what you are. You're a disruptor of medicine, not so much from the clinical aspect, but you're disrupting the lifeline of the clinical aspect, which is the physician. I started my clinical practice, uh, Dr. Curiel, and you pen many, many years ago, 20 years ago. And one thing that I loved about healthcare and medicine is the fact that in a teaching hospital setting, we used to see patients as a team, right? Every level of acuity, no matter how uh, acute a patient was complex, you mentioned cardiomyopathy, we used to attack that certain diagnosis as a team. And it was we were able to have that patient get so much better, so much quicker, because the scope of practice to us was not our scope of practice. We looked at that patient through the lens of our education. And then when I got out of Penn and I went into home health, and I saw that we don't practice medicine as a team. We're very fragmented, we're very disjointed, we're quite dysfunctional, and at the detriment has been the patient. We, and, and we continue to get worse and worse and worse through the years. And the pandemic exposed the detriment. The pandemic exposed the reactive illness-driven healthcare model that we have right now. And there's no fix in sight. So that was the whole premise of us creating Bedrock Healthcare at Home. Create an environment that would be a sanctuary, an environment where we would look at patient care in a critical thinking way, recognizing that our patient has changed. Our patient no longer uh, uh, needs episodic health care. Our patient has changed to the fact that they need chronic care continuous management. Our patient... Uh, over the age of 60, 70, 80, they have four, five, six chronic conditions, but yet they're using the ED and urgent care as primary care. Think about that. We have completely, completely um, distanced the relationship between a physician and a patient, and, pa and physicians have five to seven minutes to see patients now. They see them less and less often, and they also have to, in five to seven minutes, go through their medication list, their specialist, in <laughs> engage their current complaints, and then expect them to get them better. There's, there, there's no, I think, um, uh, rocket science to have to decipher that our healthcare system is beyond broken. And it needs change agents like ourselves. So, so in, in the fact that you are creating this community of docs, what are the main points of contention that you see that are affecting medicine, clinicians, and the future of healthcare? There's many. Uh, so one of them is the insurance companies. They are um, making the interaction um, much more cumbersome. They're not, it's not flowing smoothly because of what insurance necessitates. It's things like prior authorizations that require more time and energy out of the doctor that are not part of the patient visit. It's the denials of those things that the doctor prescribes, whether it be medications or it be testing. So that just adds to the cumbersome load of the doctor's workday because, I mean, the old in the old day, if the doctor said you need medication X, you would get medication X. There would be no question about it. But nowadays there is somebody there to challenge that and say, well, who says that the person needs medication X? And it's like, I say it because I'm a physician. Well, that's not enough. And then you've got non-physicians on top of that at the other end, making that decision. It just makes no sense. So that's number one uh, gripe. Other gripes include things that patients share, not that they don't share the insurance gripe, but for example, the EHR system you just mentioned earlier, the doctors aren't happy about the EHR system. The EHR system is presenting a ton more work for us to do per patient um, so that every time we see, I think the last stat was that for every um, hour of 
patient care that we were doling out that we need to do 15 minutes of chart work of wow. chart work. Yeah. I think that was, don't quote me on that, but I think that that was the number and it's 15 minutes. It's 15 minutes too much, basically. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. And that's the point. And then, you know, and then the doctor tries to make it better by filling out the paperwork during the visit. And of course, then it, it hurts the patient because the patient's like the doctor's not even looking at me. They're not making eye contact. They're not listening. Well, we've got to document what you say and then click into like 7,000 boxes, some of which are not even relevant. So the doctors get upset by the EHR. Another thing that they vent about is that, um, you know, Patient empowerment is such a great thing. It's such a powerful thing nowadays. But what you have is you have patients that have armed themselves with answers and they're coming into the doctor's office to basically um, either tell them that's the answer and then they want this and that testing or they want that this and that medication. And the doctor has to spend the time actually getting to know the story and seeing if that's correct. And sometimes the doctor has to spend the time convincing them otherwise. So it's this really kind of catch 22 process of trying to dole out medical care in a great way, but having patients that are empowered be empowered in the wrong way. There's a lot of pseudoscience out there. And so that's another, you know, thing that they vent about is the pseudoscience and the fact that there's wrong information that goes out there. Um, and a lot of people that aren't doctors that say that they're doctors. And that leads me to yet another issue that goes on. And that's that um, it's there's scope creep. So there's really like the other day I read and I posted in the community to see what, what did you say? Thought. Scope creeps. Scope. scope creep. So that pertains. Never, never to, heard that. Yeah. That basically pertains to others that aren't doctors sort of creeping into the doctor realm where the patients now don't really know, right? It becomes nebulous whether you're actually seeing the person that you think that you're seeing. I'll give you an example from my real life. My mother, um, shout out to my mom, she just had a knee operation that was really complex and you know a major operation, and she now needs to have some major physical therapy. Well, she noticed right? She just assumed, great, I'm going to the physical therapist and she's going to go there. She's got it all set up. She just noticed that it's actually a physical therapy assistant that's going to see her. It's a big difference. Right. And she was like, wait a second. Um, I want to see the physical therapist. And this is very similar to what's happening a lot of times in medicine mm -hmm. where um, sometimes they're called doctors. They're not necessarily doctors. And again, not knocking the different roles that we need in medicine, for example, PAs and NPs, um, there are roles for those uh, specific healthcare careers in medicine, but scope creep refers to the fact that there's more and more of them that are being called doctor and the patient is actually thinks that they're seeing the physician. And the latest thing that I saw was a... Um, on social media, and I don't know whether this is true or not, I can only imagine that it is, that they're looking to kind of form a degree that's called nurse physician. Oh, you can what? imagine, right. And you can imagine that it's not going over too well with the doctors because the doctor reaction is, well, they can go to medical school and then they can be called physician. Like, why do you need a nurse physician title? And how do you even get that if you're not going to med school? Like we're either as a society going to say, these are the requirements to become a physician. This is what's required. Um, or we say, you know what, maybe there are other things required to be a physician, but we need to decide that before we unleash an entire new career and another new profession on to patients and, you know, hopefully heal them. So, so those are just a little sampling of, you know, just maybe four or five of the things that we talk about, but believe me, there's many more. We talk about digital entrepreneurship in, in order to be successful in any realm of entrepreneurship, you have to deal with bureaucracy. And right now medicine, I mean, when you talk about insurance, 
the, and and the, and the, I always say the most laborious and the most difficult journey we will ever take as human beings is that healthcare journey. Unfortunately, most of us do when we're older, vulnerable, highly exploitable, demented, and and depressed, right? And and and, totally. and anxious and all that good stuff. Um, totally. And and the insurances know that, and they 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 know how to financially exploit us. They know how to take advantage of us. Totally. And, and you're right. They also know how to create landmines or, along that path. So sometimes people just give up. Right. And they and they don't take that that journey. And we, we, we talked about our practice is really focused on making sure that that journey, that path is seamless and it and it's facilitated by a group of people. I I so I'll tell you that. And, and again, I want to hear your perspective on this. And I agree with you. I agree with you that insurance, EHR, uh, you call Dr. Google, you know, Facebook doctors. Uh, we have them all right. Scope creep, identity politics, right? Which, which when, right now have people identifying themselves as doctors or not, believe me. But I really believe, I really believe that the AMA and the lobbying and the advocacy efforts of physicians have failed physicians highly. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to make the, and I've made this analogy before, Dr. Kerr, but I want to hear your perspective on this. There is, and I'm going to compare a, a, a medical doctor to a quarterback of a, of a sports team. You like quarterbacks? You like football? What do you like, the Giants up there? Yes, Giants. My yeah, boys love yeah, it. So me too. I will, yeah, I'm vicariously a, live through them. <laughs> I'm a big Giants fan, Daniel Jones, eh, but I'm a, I'm a big quarterback. Phil Sims, when we were a little younger, Hosteller. So the quarterback has basically three jobs, three things that they do. They read the defense, they read the offense, and then they pass the ball or, or hand it off, right? They're highly skilled, highly trained, and they only have to do those three things. And they're highly paid, by the way. And they're the divas of the team, and they're who everybody hopes to be, right? Then you look at the medical doctor. They, all, they basically have to do three things. They have to analyze the lab work, right? They have to do an assessment, and then they have to formulate an intervention plan, right? That's basically what they do. But think Absolutely. about this. But think about this. A quarterback of a sports team would never be asked to do those three things and also own the team, manage the team, coach the team, sell the tickets, right? Be everywhere. Scout the, the players, you know, and, 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 and also, guess what? Run the ball, pass it, and catch it. But w that's what we're expecting the physician to do in medicine. They have to own the practice, run the practice, build the practice, do the documentation, market the practice, also <laughs> talk to specialists, also get the patient, market. Uh, to me, we have created an impossible journey for a physician to be successful because a physician should only do one, the three things, clinical lab work, assessment, and then design an intervention because essentially you're saving that person's life i that's what i see wrong with medicine so that's why i go back to the advocacy efforts we are getting physicians from the get-go started erroneously and the sensationalism of specialty care has only made medicine worse because it's not sexy to be a primary care physician it's not sexy to be a geriatrician it's not sexy to be an internist you got to be a urologist you got to be a radiologist you got to be a cardiologist you got to be an orthopedic surgeon because that's where you make more money and guess what you're going to be more and more and more in debt and now you're going to be at the mercy more and more and more of the system. So something has got to be done to stop that multifactorial army Swiss knife that physicians think they are and have these guys say, hey, listen, if you want to be part of a, a medical practice, if you want to have a, a, a viable practice, focus on clinical practice and maybe outsource the rest. But I, I, I do think that physicians have made it harder on themselves because they want to do it all. They want to do it all. And you and again, maybe in the 1940s and 50s when we only dealt with a, a an impacted bowel or a hole in the bowel and antibiotics and pneumonia, maybe. But the, the, the patient has changed. And aging is very multifactorial. And people are living longer with less years in their life. We're just we're, we're adding years. We're not adding life to their years. But anyway, that's another subject. What do you think about that? Because I think that's the crux of the issue. I, I always tell my physicians here. They, they only have to here. They only do those three things. We have an infrastructure here, Dr. Curiel, that does all the other stuff. 
We deal with the insurance. We chase the money. We, 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 we do all the bureaucracy. We market the practice. You know, the, the podcast is a way to us to platform the practice. They only need to treat patients. But I will tell you, I will tell you, the physicians that I employ sometimes get mad at me because I don't have them involved in more of the, of the management stuff. And I say, stop, treat patients. Let me do the other stuff because you're highly trained to do a very highly specialized job. You can do it all. And I think sometimes there is that tug of war where, well, I'm the doctor. I own the practice. I should be doing it all too. You catch my drift? Like that's, that's what I struggle with sometimes. And I, and I, and I think that the physicians who, who focus on patient care and outsource the rest do the best. The ones that do it all, oh, because again, insurance is constantly changing that moving target, right, of reimbursement. So I think that it really is a nuanced conversation. I don't think it's so straightforward um, to just say yes or no. I mean, it depends what you're referring to. I can tell you that the viewpoint that the doctor can't do it all is actually what got us here in the first place where the hospital systems that are now completely in control in almost a, a mon mon like a monopoly like state that's what's actually gotten here um, and i'm also referring to the different um private equity um type uh, acquisitions of all of the doctor practices because we viewed it this way where, okay, you know what? We just need to be doing one thing. Let's let everyone else do everything else. I think that there's a happy middle. Um, I think that there is a way for physicians to own their practices and still um, bring in, maybe outsource certain aspects of it to companies that they believe in, that have proven themselves as worthy. Um, but I don't necessarily think that to say that a doctor can't do it all necessarily solves our issues because our having given away the freedom of doing it all meant that others have very cleverly and manipulatively and strategically have actually taken over to the point where they are telling us what to do, right? We didn't overnight get to a place where the insurance company suddenly gets to dictate whether what the doctor prescribed or not actually works, right? We didn't get here overnight. We didn't get here overnight where the hospital system is getting reimbursed more for a practice because they own that practice than if that practice were to be private and alone. Like, Think about that. That makes no sense that if a physician owns a practice, a procedure done at that practice would actually pay out less yeah, than it's, if it's, that it's, same practice. It's become a selling point for hospitals and, and big healthcare systems to purchase a physician's office and tell the physician, hey, you're going to get $150 for your, for your visit, but if you join us, you're going to get automatically $250 for that visit. And so again, that is the problem, is that by saying doctors can't do it all, doctors kind of gave into that over the years. Love that. And allowed others, right, allowed others to come in very innocently. They didn't do it because they knew that they, their hands would be bound, that they would be wearing golden handcuffs, and they didn't know that others would be in control where they would suddenly be burning out at a rate of whatever it is, right? The last stat I saw, you had mentioned some stats earlier, and the last stat I saw was that in the next year, 40% of doctors will be leaving clinical medicine, right? We can't have that as a society because society invests so much into the medical schools. And again, we pay for the medical schools. Most medical schools are paid for by the uh, the student themselves. Sure. But, right, so much goes into that person. And then for them to leave is just a wasted resource. And I say it firsthand because I left clinical medicine to run my digital venture full time. And I got a ton of hate when I came out and announced it. Not for my patients. My patients were extremely gracious. Um, I didn't leave for any bad reasons. I completely left because I knew that my venture was going to make a dent in healthcare and it has. Um, but in writing a Medscape article, 
that was published, um, I got a ton of you know a ton of supportive comments and also a ton of very judgmental of course um, comments that at the time really hurt and at the time i just um you know i i was very vulnerable i think because i was still very close to having practiced and it really hurt me to think that people thought that i either was giving given up or was a wasted resource etc cetera, etc cetera. and yet here i am saying that no you're making it better I, I i have never heard that point from a physician or a colleague, and it makes perfect sense. You're right. Sometimes the noble actions of trying to gain help attracts the enemy. I agree. Yeah. I I agree with you. I agree with you 100. Yeah. percent If there if if you're surrounded by the right people, it's things are only going to get better. But unfortunately, creating an environment of help has created an environment of now. Wow, that help has actually become my detriment. I love that. Uh, w one thing that that I admire about you, amidst amongst m many things, is the the again the courage to break the mold, get out, and you're right, kind of navigate that path on your own. And I know you started kind of going down the line that I had that on, on, on my agenda, but tell the audience because that's got to be a very listen. After many, many, many years of education, I mean, you're you're talking, you know. Um, undergrad, grad, residency, certifications, taking boards, sleepless nights. Right. My goodness. You, sacrifice is, is probably at the top of the list of what you have to do with your life. Your, your life is secondary. Your three kids are secondary. Yeah. Yeah. Medicine is number one. Tell me the courage and what finally it took for you to get out and, and, and do this venture. And you started talking about a little bit of that transfer trauma that occurred, but I want more because I'll tell you right now, Dr. Curl, there are more people in your shoes right now listening that are so afraid at that cliff, right? And they want to jump off and some of them want to jump off without a parachute. But sometimes when you jump, you fly and you yeah. and, and you did that. So tell yeah. the courage that it took for you to do that, because I think that will really encourage and empower, right? If we're talking about empowering other physicians, right. that will do that. Yeah, it's very difficult. Um, it does take a ton of courage and commitment, and you have to do it at the right time. Um, you know, I... I I'm almost at a loss of words because everything comes rushing back. And I think also because I haven't fully come to terms with the fact that I left, right? I mean, the first part of my life essentially was dedicated to healthcare giving and to the patients that I thought I was going to see on a regular basis and that I actually enjoyed seeing. Those relationships were the best part of being a physician, a practicing physician. And I don't have that anymore. Now, that has been swapped with regular communication and interactions with physicians that are either broken or looking to build a brand or looking to set up their own private practice or looking to break away from hospitals that quote own them. Um, and I absolutely love it because I'm still helping um, and I'm still making an impact and a dent and I'm doing it on my terms. I'm doing it on my time. I get to raise my children um, and I get to support my husband who is also a physician. So that's another thing is that we were two physicians. And so it was like a double whammy in our family. Um, I think that you have to really just come to terms with the fact that when it's time, it's time um, there is more to life than just your career. Um, and you can make it work. Obviously, it's everyone's got their own factors, right, to factor in. I mean, it matters that you still provide for the for your family the way that you need to provide. Maybe you need to adjust the way that they need to be provided for. Maybe you don't need to live in the ritziest neighborhood. Maybe you need to downsize a bit. Maybe you don't need all the glitz and glamour, right? So I can't speak to everyone when I say that. I had to make my own decisions with leaving. It was extremely difficult, but I did. And I can truly say that I am, truly, truly say that I'm happier than ever. And it's not because I don't like medicine and it's not because I don't love patients, but it is because practicing medicine nowadays, especially as a primary care doctor, is extremely difficult when you're doing it for a system when you're doing it for someone else. Love it. 
couple more things because I know I know we're on a tight schedule, but I, I I would be remiss if I didn't get your prescription. This is Dr. Curiel's prescription to the new age doc, right? That has that is there either starting, um, you know, ending or in the middle of their journey. How do they create their brand? So give me five off the cuff prescription for a better digital footprint as an aspiring physician. Again, no matter where the journey is. Okay, off the cuff. So the first one is <clears throat> studying the field. I think it's really important to take a look around and really soak up what other people are doing. Some of those concepts you're going to really identify with and they're going to connect with you and you're going to say, that works. I'm going to kind of do that in, with a twist. Um, others aren't. And you're going to actually learn from that and say, I'm not going to do that because I see the negative impact that it has. Um, so first and foremost is observing. Um, the second pointer would be to um, to think about a brand in terms of um, uh, in terms of where you're going to be present. So are you going to build a website and be present there? Are you going to use social media in then marketing your website and socializing with people through that sense and maybe helping to market your the services that you give? through your website, right? So those are concepts that in and of themselves are extremely sophisticated, right? You've got to, um, if you want to take on Twitter, if you want to take on uh, Instagram, if you want to take on LinkedIn or Facebook, they all work differently. Um, the third thing is, and I mentioned website, but the third thing is to really, really think about taking out a website for yourself. I call it prime virtual real estate property. Mm. Um, everyone really should own a website of their own. Even though I'm not active on drcoriel.com, it's there. And people can reach me and send me inquiries. And I use it as a portfolio to show that, yes, I this is who I am. Here's my bio. And if you need to contact me, you can do that there. Of course, I'm also you know, present on SomiDocs. I'm in the directory so people can find me there because that's my business, but I need my own space. So I always tell my docs, yes, I want you to become involved in SomiDocs and become a member, but you've got to have your own space. I will not own your space. You will own your space and you will use SomiDocs to kind of help you understand that space and, and branch out, et cetera. Um, another little tip is, let's see, another little tip is figuring out which social media platform really speaks to you and which one you really connect with, maybe dabbling in that initially, um, really connecting there. A lot of physicians make it really big in one platform, um, and that's fine. Um, I do like to give the tip of, uh, diversifying on social media. It's really not that hard. So as long as you have a website, you could take snippets of the blog post, let's say that you write on there or the thoughts that you have daily, and you could sprinkle it around on basically most major social media platforms. And all it requires is just one of those scheduling apps that takes your thought and just kind of shoots it out into all the social platforms. And you've got a bigger bang for your effort buck there. So I think those are you know, a good five tips off the cuff Love that it. really help, right. That really help not only physicians, but by the way, my own sons, of my course. own college age son, who is, you know, you know, on a business track and a biotech track, but also needs to put himself out there and say, Hey, this is who I am. And this is what I am smart in. Maybe there's a project that works for me. We just had a cybersecurity uh, expert and and we and he advised that every aspiring professional should take cybersecurity classes, coding classes, because it unfortunately or fortunately encompasses the scope. Whether you're in medicine, business, accounting, you're gonna have to deal with cybersecurity. Rapid fire: yeah. iPhone versus Android. Which one? iPhone. Facebook or Instagram? Ooh, Instagram. TikTok, YouTube. YouTube. Videos or blogs? Videos. Windows or Mac? Mac. Oh, we, 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 <laughs> we, hit, it, we hit it on the money. We, 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm thinking all the answers. Last two questions. What makes Dr. Curiel happy? Being with my family, no, hands down. 
and tell me how Dr. Curiel grew up. Oh, that gets deep. I grew up as an only child with loving parents that expected a lot of me, but gave me a lot of love. Um, immigrants, first generation immigrant right here. Very proud to be the first person to go to med school. In what country? I was born in Israel. Okay. Immigrated here when I was 10. Um, so that's how I grew up. I grew up with a completely different culture in a different part of the world. Um, landed here when I was 10, didn't speak English. Um, so that's how Dr. Coriel grew up and I'm proud of who I've become and I'm proud of sticking to my guns and sort of doing the things that I believe in, even though people didn't understand them while I was building them. And now I see people, you know, trying to build what I have built and I don't take offense to it. I take it as flattery Absolutely. Um, and I love it. Listen, I, I will give you a, 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 a ton of compliments because I've enjoyed the conversation. You, and you mentioned that one of the most difficult things you did was leave medicine. I don't think you, you left. I just think you're practicing medicine differently. The, the reason that we decide to go into healthcare medicine is because of one gigantic word that sometimes doesn't get repeated enough, and that's the word beneficence, right? Beneficence. We like to help others, right? And the Hippocratic oath that is taken is that you will do no harm, right? And you are practicing medicine because you are helping those clinicians that are essentially are saving lives. And I, I think that the most beautiful thing about practicing medicine for anybody is that changing one person only changes that person. But when you change others, you change the world. And what you're doing with social me, with so me docs, what you're doing with your uh, even the, even the, the house of God, oh my God, that is so impactful. You are practicing medicine probably at a much more sophisticated level than any physician out there. And, and, and for that, I give you a tremendous amount of kudos. I would love, would love to have you on the podcast in person. I'm telling you, you and I can probably talk for hours and hours and hours and hours. I think this is only the beginning of our relationship. And uh, I, I think there's so much to offer, so much that we can talk about. I have like 10 things that I want to talk to you about, but maybe we'll leave it for the next one. But I will tell you, never shortchange yourself and say you're not a doctor. You are more than a doctor. You are a human being that is looking at life and how it needs to be lived rather than be dictated by other people. And that is a change agent. That is someone who practices medicine. And that is someone who I'm proud to be to, to, to be connected with. And I think it's something that medicine needs more because there's a lot of people right now out there, Dr. Curiel, who are ashamed of medicine. They're ashamed of their doctor. They're ashamed of, 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 of knowing that that relationship has been severed. You are creating more engagement, more embracing, and making it better for physicians out there. I give you a ton of credit. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. And again, hopefully we'll have you again. And we are changing the habits of yesterday by creating the new healthcare reality of tomorrow. Thank you so much. Have a great day, and we'll talk soon.